powdered cold things. Well, so you might want to start thinking about that now. Peanut butter and uh, powdered cold things. Pokemon cards or hundred dollar bills for your yeah. account future. Yeah. I'm just saying. I'm just throwing out ideas. Yeah. What? Um. Right, we'll talk. Because it's recording now, and I don't want to be. That's admissible in a court of law. All right, let's go. Uh, we'll come back to that. It's continuity. This is fun stuff. Or is it? It is. Of course. All calculus is fun. Well, not all. That's the big deal. The uh, definition of, the formal definition of limits is not fun. That's brain melting. When hell freezes over, if I can avoid it. <laughs> Okay, we're going to talk about some continuity at a point and at an open interval. Obviously, we're going to figure out what the word continuity means. Uh, we're going to look at one-sided limits. One-sided limits will be uh, if you have a function that stops. How do you handle the limit on the side that has a graph, and how do you handle the limit on the side that has nothing there? We'll talk about some properties of continuity. And uh, we're going to talk about the intermediate value theorem, which from a practical standpoint is easy from a calculus standpoint eh, not quite so much but quite doable okay so continuity what does it mean for a function to be continuous or even more simply put what does the word <coughs> continuous mean Molly? no breaks no breaks how would you see a break in a graph let's suppose it was non-continuous or actually sorry the correct sorry to interrupt the correct term is discontinuous if it had a hole, so there was an A hole, excellent. Any other ideas? That's one of the three possibilities. Olivia? A jump. A jump, very good. That's two. Lucas? An asymptote. Asymptote, three. You guys are done already. Great job. Let's go. Okay. For our practical purposes, if you're just looking at a graph, it's continuous if you can draw the graph without picking up your pencil. And the three things that these guys just outlined are what's going to cause problems. If there's a hole, if there's a jump or there's an asymptote. So here's a couple instances. Uh, this one is discontinuous because we have a hole. There's a jump, there's a mess. Okay. This one has a hole in it and it's got a value filling it. I, didn't, I don't have a graph of asymptotes, which we'll get to in a second. Okay. And notice it's on the open interval. We do make kind of a big deal about closed intervals and open intervals in this class. This would be called an open interval because it's not including the endpoints. If it's including the endpoints, it's called a closed interval, and we have brackets there. Okay, this is important. Write it down. This is what we call, as it says, the definition of continuity. In order for a function to be continuous, it must satisfy all three conditions. And there's a couple different parts to this. First of all, we've got a function f of x. That's fine. But you also have to be comfortable with the notation here. We commonly refer to the letter c as some point in the interval. Some random point. It can be whatever it wants. So we take that point c. Who knows where it is, but it's somewhere in the interval. And we want to determine if the function is continuous at that point. These three conditions have to be met. First of all, it has to be defined. Second of all, it has to, be a, has to have a limit. And thirdly, the value of the limit has to match the value of the function. Has to be defined. Well, how would a function not be defined at a point? Eric? A hole, good. How would a function not have a limit? Let's go back a slide. This is not defined. Does this have a limit, though? Yes. Yes. Luke? Uh, it would not have a limit if it were a continuous graph. Say that again. If the graph was continuous, it would not have a limit. Oh, it would, though. It's the exact opposite. Olivia? It has a jump. Yeah, a jump. No limit there. Okay. Is this, is this graph defined everywhere? Right? Yes? Yeah. Every value from 
here to here from between the two endpoints, there is a value for every C in that interval. No matter where you pick a spot, there's a value. The first one doesn't work. There's a spot here at C where it's not defined. Okay? This one's okay though. It's all defined, however, there's no limit there. And then the third thing was that the value of the limit has to match the value of the function. Do the endpoints not need And you'll, excuse me, um, you'll see why in a minute. Okay. Step three, the limit must match the definition. The th whoops, wrong way. The third picture is an explanation of that. It's defined everywhere. It has a limit, but the value at C, at the value of the function does not match the value of the limit. So this limit would come into this open circle that would be the answer for the limit, but the de definition of the function is the solid dot. Okay. So we, we have a, a two parts to that. One is the practicality. If I give you a picture of a graph, you should be able to tell me, yeah, that's continuous, or no, it's not. Because you could just say, well, can I draw that without picking up my pencil? Great. However, from a calculus standpoint, you're going to need to know those three things has to be defined, has to have a limit, and the limit has to equal the value of the function. The next question is then, well, what is C? And C can be any value in that function. So as soon as you see one of the problems, no pun intended, it's going to create a problem. Okay? Got this? Yeah. Good. All right, first uh, is what's called removable discontinuity is the fancy term for a hole. So if you're trying to impress your friends, you talk about the discontinuity of a hole, but if you're around a bunch of math nerds, you want to use the term removable discontinuity. And we get, remember, the hole is generated by factoring a rational function and canceling. Nothing much to write down there, except the second one is a jump discontinuity. Those commonly occur during piecewise functions. Comes in from one side to a value, goes out the other side at a different value. And then the third thing is an asymptote. How do you get an asymptote in a function? Nobody? <coughs> Can you take? Yes, Luke. Uh, if you have a value of x in the denominator of a function. Awesome. Like that. It's a spot where the value is completely undefined. And an asymptote is called an infinite discontinuity. It's called an infinite discontinuity because obviously it goes either to negative infinity or to positive infinity around that asymptote. How are we doing so far? So, so. Let's cause a problem. Just the whole thing. Words. Big yeah, words and numbers, pictures. Mm -hmm. Throw that all in the mix, stir it up. I'm sorry, what? Colors. colors are freaking out. You'd rather, you prefer monochromatic? Yeah. Maybe is John, he speaking for everyone? John is up there. No. 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 Claire, I don't mean to call you out on this, but think about what you just asked him. Yeah. If he was colorblind, would he be bothered by the color? <laughs> <laughs> Right. I mean, a blind person's not going to be bothered by flashing lights, or a deaf person by loud noises. You're not colorblind, are you? You can be colorblind and still see some colors, though. Yeah, you can see like, like red, blue, colorblind. Correct. Depending on, yeah, Dumbo is, what is he, red and green? I don't know, I just like can only see some yeah, colors. Yeah. Yeah. You should see some of the outfits he comes in in the morning. Like, what are you wearing? I'm colorblind. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're not going to make a big deal out of one-sided limits, but what we are going to do is talk about them. So let's suppose we have this. Um, first of all, what does that look like? Because this is easier to understand if you think about the graph. Half circle. Give me some more. Top of a half circle. Give me some more. 
radius of 2. Good. Semicircle, centered about the origin with a radius of 2. It looks like this. Okay. So let's start with something simple. What's the limit as you approach negative 2 from the right of that function? Zero, it's right there, in case you can't read. Yeah. If you come along the graph as I'm getting closer and closer, as I approach negative two, I'm approaching a value of zero. What about if you come from the left? Still zero. Still, still zero. Still zero, one possible answer. Anybody else want to jump on the zero bandwagon? It doesn't come from it. It doesn't come from anything. Like it doesn't come from the left. It, goes it doesn't come. You can't come from the left? Oh, it doesn't come in. Okay, so answer my question. What's the limit as you approach negative 2 from the left? Does not exist is another answer. Anybody want to offer something even more bizarre? Lydia? Oh, that's an interesting answer. Okay. Anybody else? Undefined. So not does not exist, but you're going with undefined. Yeah. <laughs> How do you uh, differentiate between undefined and does not exist? Well, if um, does not exist would be like a, was kind of, but um, if you do undefined, right, it'd be like a line that's straight up and down. So there's no line to the left of negative two. So the only way to approach negative two not from the right would be from directly above directly above. So like if you're in the woods and you're attacked by a creature with the head of a bear, the wings of an owl, and the legs of a centipede, yeah. right? Yeah. That would be an undefined monster. Yes. But it still exists. It does still exist. Right. If you were attacked by nothing, then it would, it not, would exist. not exist. Okay. All right, I can go with that. But you're saying undefined then. So there is a limit, we just don't know what to call it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, undefined doesn't become the name of it or the description, it's just we don't know. So what's the answer? How do we handle it? We all the above. We ask me. Good. Try that on the AP test. Uh, can I go find my teacher? <laughs> What if, can I put like this grass is clunky and teach us this? Yeah, try that. College Board will love that. There is no limit. If there's no path to travel, then you can't have a limit. There's nothing there to take the limit of. Even if there was some imaginary path over there that would eventually get us to being zero as the limit, there's nothing over there. So it doesn't have a limit. In other words, you can't have a limit for an area that doesn't have any part of the function in it. So we just answered that question. It's undefined. Which means what? Wait, is it undefined oh, or is it I was right. it? <laughs> Sorry, not undefined. I said it wrong. He, he got me all freaked out by, <laughs> by the monster in the woods. It does not exist. So what is the limit as you approach negative 2 of the function? With no direction on it. You can't do that. It does not exist. does not exist. Why? And that's a question you're going to be asked. If it does not exist, why doesn't that limit exist? Perfect. Which is this. Okay. We've talked about this already, but I'm emphasizing it again. This is going to be your explanation for most of the times that limits break down. Why doesn't that thing have a limit? Because the left-hand limit doesn't match the right-hand limit. So in the previous example, if I come from the right, the limit is zero. If I come from the left, it does not exist. Zero is not equal to does not exist, therefore, no limit at the point. Okay. So not only is the bottom important, but you also need to get comfortable with the terminology that I put in the boxes up here on the top. You need to understand things like what is a C term? What is the capital L represent? What is F of X? Understand the limit notation. As x approaches c plus, does that mean coming from the right or from the left? It's not heading towards the positive direction. It's coming from the positive direction. OK, how are we doing? Good. Uh, we don't care. 
properties of conduit. So if a function is continuous, what do we know about it? Well, there's a couple of interesting things. I would suggest you paraphrase this instead of just carrying, copying it down. And the red at the bottom is the paraphrase. If I take a function that's continuous and I multiply it by a number, the product will be continuous. The same is true with all the other, the other four functions. Add two continuous functions, you get a continuous function. Subtract two continuous functions, you get a continuous function, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If, however, one of those functions is discontinuous, it does not work. You can't take a continuous function, add it to a discontinuous function, and all of a sudden, work magic. We good? Yo. Does that apply if it's two discontinuous functions? So, I'm, um, how do I phrase this? If you add two continuous functions, you'll get another continuous function. That doesn't necessarily mean that if you add two discontinuous functions, they would be discontinuous. You can, I can't think of an example right now, but it would be possible to take two discontinuous functions, add them together, and magically it becomes continuous. So it only has to do with continuous not becoming discontinuous. Mm -hmm. This you need to remember. All polynomial functions, like it says, are continuous. You will be asked on a problem, is this function continuous? Or the hypothesis, you'll see in the what we're about to do in the intermediate value theorem, the hypothesis of the interve intermediate value theorem requires that you figure out if that function is continuous or not before you proceed. <coughs> if it's not, then you can't move on. Okay? So, this you need to remember. This is going to be your explanation. If you're looking at a, a polynomial, then it's always going to be continuous. I guess I should ask the question, do you all know how to identify a polynomial? What makes a polynomial a polynomial? Better yet, what isn't a polynomial? Maybe it's a good thing we're talking about this. Linear function is or isn't a polynomial? It is a polynomial function. Okay. Things that, Eric? Go ahead. What's the worst thing that happened? You're wrong. Yeah. Lucas turns around and points and laughs at you. Yeah. It's a daily occurrence anyway. Well, I realized that <laughs> line I was wrong. I was going to say a straight line, but that's also a polynomial. But you could just uh, add by x and have a zero coefficient of x. It's not a function, it's not a polynomial. That's true. <laughs> I don't know how much that helps us, but thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure like, what the equation would be, like it's just a point. <laughs> that is a polynomial. Yeah, like two okay. is actually two x raised to the zero power. Okay. So this is that the denominator of one. Correct. In other words, rational functions are not polynomials. X squared minus three x plus two over x minus one is not a polynomial. Square root functions are not polynomials. Polynomials are what you think they are. X's raised to powers. Okay. What'd you say? Okay. Composite functions, it's the same thing that we had on the other. So if you add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you get another continuous. If you put a continuous function into another continuous function, it stays continuous. Okay, let's move on to the intermediate value theorem. Uh, tangent, we can skip this. You all know that the tangent is discontinuous because it has asymptotes, right? All right, great, let's go on. Okay, intermediate value theorem. This is much more important. So before I give you the intermediate value theorem, let's skip ahead to this thing. 
Suppose a girl is five foot tall on her 13th birthday and five foot seven on her 14th birthday. Then for any height h between five feet and five seven, there must be a time when she is that height. Does that make sense? You don't magically wake up one morning and go from five foot to five foot seven. Somewhere along the way, there is some day where you are every single height in between five foot and five foot seven. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So we can apply that idea to what's called the intermediate value theorem. And we get a picture like this. If I start with a y value of one for some function and the function is continuous, that's important. If f is continuous on the closed interval, that's our hypothesis. That has to be established before you move on with the intermediate value theorem. If the function is discontinuous, you're done. You can't use intermediate value theorem, move on next problem. And that's gonna happen. I'm gonna give you a function, ask you some questions, and if you forget to check if it's continuous, you're gonna do a bunch of work for a problem that doesn't involve a bunch of work. Okay, so check to see that it's continuous first. Most of the time that's gonna happen because it's a polynomial. And what the intermediate value theorem says is if I go from a y value of one to a y value of five, for example, I have to pass every value in between. So somewhere along that path, I was at 1.764219744921643. Or three, or four, or any of those other things. This is not the most practical way we're gonna use this. The way we're gonna use the intermediate value theorem is to find zeros on graphs. Or at least get an idea of where that zero would be. Go ahead. So k is any number between the two? Hawkman says there's at least one number where f of c would be k. I don't get that. It means that if you go from if you go from five foot to five foot seven, you've got to have it at least crossed a height at least once. Height is a difficult one because it doesn't you just go in one direction. But this function could do a bunch of stuff like that. So what this is saying is it crosses this number at least once. Could be 10 times, could oh, be a okay. billion times. So C is like? Any number. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's see how we apply this in a problem. Uh, ba -ba -ba -da -ba -da -da -ba. There it is. Okay. So we take a function. I purposely included in the problem that statement that it's a polynomial function in case you get confused. It is a polynomial function, it's a cubic. It's not rational, it's not a square root. So that means we've satisfied the initial part of the intermediate value theorem. Now we wanna show that somewhere along the graph, it crosses the x-axis between zero and one. I'm not asking you where it crosses the x-axis. I just want you to prove to me that somewhere between 0 and 1 it crosses the x-axis. Excuse me. So I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to figure out two things. I want to know what's f of 0 and what's f of 1. Do those for me, please. Regardless of what the graph looks like, I know that at 0, I'm at negative 1. And at 1, I'm up at 2. And the function is continuous. So the question is, can I draw a path from negative 1 up to this value of 2 without crossing the x-axis? No. I gotta do what? You gotta go around it. 
to kick. You went far enough. You could go on three. How far would I have to go? Infinity plus one. Infinity plus one. If possible. That's the key. It's not possible. And getting back to your point, my path to go from here to here could be as something as simple as that. Or it could go all kinds of wonkiness by... Okay, that's why the function, or that's why the definition says at least one point. Okay. All right. It doesn't tell me anything about where that zero is. We can go and find that zero later. But what the intermediate value theorem says is that it's got to cross at some point between 0 and 1. Question? Stretching. Stretching. Okay. Yeah, so it did all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yep. Yep. There we go. And there's a picture of what it looks like. So would there be a pole in there or is it an actual point? That's actual point. That's where it crosses the x-axis. Okay. So again, the intermediate value theorem doesn't tell you where the 0 is. It just proves that there is a 0 there. We can use some other techniques to find out where that zero is, but all we're trying to show is that it is that it does exist somewhere between zero and one. Okay, so so yeah. Is it always crossing the x-axis that it's just this particular example? Okay. So for instance, I might take a function and I say um, show that this function has a value equal to four between or on the closed interval from negative ten to ten. Then you would plug in negative ten and ten. Right. And if negative 10 gives you a value of 3 and positive 10 gives you a value of 5, somewhere it's got to cross. Okay. This one's easier <clears throat> excuse me, because you're looking at a sign change. f of 0 was a negative value. f of 1 was a positive value. So if it goes from negative to positive, it's got to cross. So will it always give you the interval? Yes. Okay. They have to. Otherwise, you can't solve it. That's day 12. Okay, but is it day 11 or day 12? Day 12. Day 12. It is day 12. So we're not doing day 11. Day 11? We, you did day 11 already. Right. That was day 11. Okay, okay, okay.